Senator Paul, thank you so very much. Thank you. All right. So we are, uh, let's take a, a trip down memory lane just until to yesterday morning. It's not a long trip. But we were very lucky uh, at the opening of the show yesterday morning to have the mayor of San Francisco, Edwin Lee, come up and join us on stage uh, to open the show. And we talked about uh, technology, innovation, and our industry. And now we're very lucky to have the chief innovation officer of the city of San Francisco, Jay Nath, come to join us to introduce, to, give, to present the uh, Ad Tech SF Big 2012 Innovator Award. Uh, like I said, he's the chief, innovator, chief innovation officer of the city of San Francisco. And I asked him for something, to, something unusual about him, and he's a crazy biker. And in fact, he biked here today, which when you look at what, he, what he's wearing, he must have either changed or been quite, quite, a, uh, quite a spectacle. So let's get, bring him on out. Jay Nath, CIO for San Francisco. Come on out. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jay Nath. And I'm San Francisco's first Chief Innovation Officer under Mayor Ed Lee. And this new position reflects the mayor's strong commitment to technology and innovation and his understanding that it can be transformative and change local government. A great example of this is our launch of ImproveSF.com, uh, an online platform for uh, civic engagement that was uh, announced here by our mayor yesterday at AdTech SF. And if you haven't checked it out, please do. And if you want to learn more about that initiative or others that we're doing here in San Francisco, uh, please go to innovation.sfgov.org. And also, we're looking for volunteers. So if you live here in San Francisco, please let us know. Drop us a line, uh, because we don't have any budget here. Um, now, I'd like to turn my attention to SFBIG and the great work that they're doing here in San Francisco and the Bay Area. They recognize that we need to push the boundaries, that we need to challenge the status quo, and really uh, recognize the value of innovation. Uh, so it's very fitting that we're here in San Francisco, the innovation capital of the world, uh, to recognize thought leaders in this space. Uh, with that, I'm pleased to announce the first ever AdTech SF and SFBIG Innovator Award, which goes to Brian Monahan. Managing partner of Magna Global. Brian has been a pioneer in the internet advertising space and is a thought leader. Brian? Uh, cool, thanks, Jay. Um, it's obviously super sweet. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, folks at AdTech. Uh, Warren and, and Mike and Brad Barons. I think, uh, I think to be honest with you, I think I got Brad's vote because I'm probably one of the seven people on the planet who, who have actually read his doctoral thesis about why William Shakespeare was the first fully in, vertically integrated media company. Um, I'd like to thank my colleagues at uh, SFBIG, uh, Amy Rosewall, our president, uh, John Durham, our chairman, uh, David Lutz, who, who really was the, the, the guy who pushed for uh, creating this award this year, and I, I have to admit, I, I was part of the group that was throwing out names for the award and advocating for different people. I had no idea my name was in the hat. So I kind of feel like Dick Cheney when he was doing the vice presidential search for George W. Bush, and so I got the perfect guy for you. It's, it's me. Um, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm super proud to represent San Francisco, this market. I'm, San Francisco as an ad market has always been about the integration of brand building, storytelling, and technology. Um, in fact, the, the roots of our market actually go back to the late 1800s to a group of lithographers who actually had their shops not too far from here, a couple blocks from here. And in the late 1800s, they actually had sort of a technical innovation around uh, that improved the, the registration of their lithographs. And out of that came those iconic fruit crate labels that built global brands like Sunkist and, and built a global industry, the California agribusiness, that's still one of the largest industries in California to this day. So I feel like we've always done an amazing job of integrating the latest technology with brand building here in this market. I'm not, I'm not really sure what the label innovation means. Um, the people who have that award tend to be the, the guys who, who uh, save all their conference lanyards in the, in the cube and think it makes them look really smart, but really it's just antagonizing the people who had to stay back and work and, and wish they, they had the time to actually go to these uh, provocative conferences. Um, 
I, I, think, I think a more apt label for my 20 years in the business would be the uh, curiosity, curiosity and perseverance, really, is what describes it. Because uh, you know, I think all of us in this room, uh, you know, get, we get to come to work every day, and every day is sort of a discovery of something cool, some, something new of how we can use technology, how we can dr connect with human beings, how we can drive commerce. And you know, for me, that journey began you know, back when I did my first online buy in 1994 for Nestle, and we, and we, we did a little, a little display buy. And uh, in the first weekend that the buy was out, we, we blew through our fulfillment budget for the offer. And so we had to madly scramble to take the campaign down because corporate, the corporate overlords had said, you know, no advertising until we figure out our internet strategy. Yeah, I'm sure they're still working on it. But, um, you know, it made us realize this thing is so powerful. And then, you know, another, another moment that stands out is when we did the first keyword buys on InfoSeek for Amazon. And we realized that we were selling books to one out of four people who came through. And which is incredibly powerful, which turned out to be a blessing and a curse because Jeff Bezos would, would be on his computer at night and he'd be searching, you know, doing his searches and, you know, heaven help you if, you, if an Amazon banner didn't come up, you'd have a, just a blazing email to return to the next morning. And thank goodness it was pre-Blackberries. Pre, pre um, you know, another, another moment that stands out is uh, doing some of the first streaming video advertising for Microsoft and seeing bl brand lift metrics that we've never seen and you know so much so we had to do the study twice before anyone would, would believe it so just you know we, incredible you know we're, it's a constant journey of, of seeing how we can use this technology to build brands to drive commerce you know we continue to do amazing work at the IPG media lab where we're literally bringing consumers in we're wiring them up we're figuring out what type of experiences literally make their heart beat faster and we continue to be on this journey at at magna where we're trying to forecast where this media economy is going. It's, it's just a, it's such an exciting industry to be in. Um, but, you know, of course, like I always say, the reason to be in this industry is really because of the people you get to work with. And it really feels like a true community, particularly here in San Francisco, um, where everyone seems to have sort of shared interests at heart. Um, you know, I'm super excited to see where it goes next. Um, thank you for sharing this award with me, and I, I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, hold on. Thank you. Congratulations. All right, we are finally at the last panel of AdTech San Francisco 2012. Um, uh, Brian just very kindly mentioned that a couple of careers ago, uh, I was a Shakespearean. I, that's, what I, that's where I did all of my academic work. Um, it actually does apply. It's just a little hard to explain. Shakespeare famously said, music is the food of love. But there's a, to set up this next panel on music and advertising, there's a different line from Shakespeare that I want to talk about. It's from The Tempest, and it's uh, the clown, Stefano, who when he hears the, um, uh, a vision of a paradise, a, a magical kingdom, he says, that will prove a brave kingdom for me where I shall have my music for nothing. Less than 100 years ago, music was not as pervasive as it is today. Today, we're inundated by music. We have music in every conceivable moment of our lives, in the elevator, when we wake up in the morning. We've so taken music down to its atomic bits that it's now ringtones. Right? There's no moment in our lives where music is not present. And I think because of that, we, some, we take it for granted. And yet music is the thing that permeates our lives. It goes directly into the cores of our brains. If you read books like uh, Oliver Sacks' Music Ophelia, you'll find out that music has incredible effects on us as a species. We're the only uh, species that really loves music, although you know, my dog sometimes kind of you know, tends to bop around a bit. But this is our thing. Right? It, there are very few things that distinguish us as a species, uh, but laughter, tears, and music are among them. And so for advertising, we have this incredible ability to twin a brand with the most emotionally engaging thing that we have as a species, which is music. And so we have, we're very excited. We have four music companies that are coming out today to talk with you about how they're changing music for us as consumers and also for us as marketers. So let's go to bring them out one by one. And we have a, a kind of kooky device that we're going to talk about, uh, which is, we've had, and you'll find out in a moment. Let's start. Let's bring Heidi Browning out. Heidi, can you come on out? Here we go. So, 
So why don't you sit right here. Heidi and it is the SVP of, uh, of strategy, strategic, strategic, solutions. strategic solutions for, for Pandora. But for those of you in the audience, of course, we know her in from her many other roles throughout the industry. She was, uh, she was at Fox, she was at MySpace, she was at Rally here, in San, she's been here in San Francisco, and former president of SF Biggs. Let's give her a big round of applause. So, so the first question. What's Pandora doing for, for music consumers that's different? Why, why should people listen at, to, to Pandora? So Pandora's mission is to redefine radio in this connected world. And our way to do that is through personalized internet radio. And behind our personalized internet radio platform lies this magical thing called the music genome. Mm -hmm. and a lot of people think it's like a big you know, set of, cons of servers in our office, but in fact, it is 11 years of time and energy and technology that we've worked on to fine tune. We have real music analysts who are professional musicians who analyze each and every song that comes into the music genome. They base it on like 450 musicological traits and then um, they put it into the genome. So this allows you to define what's the music you like, and then the genome serves up music that's the next closest musicological match. So it enables this tremendous amount of music discovery and rediscovery of the music you may not have listened to in a long time. And what this is doing is creating a new personalized listening experience for our Pandora users. And our, our greatest testament to the success of the business is every day whether it's on Twitter or Facebook or just emails to um, our team, we hear about people saying, Pandora knows me, Pandora's playing me today. And that's, that's where we glean our success. That's really cool. And so, but it's not a place to go to get a specific song. You don't go to Pandora, like I'm, I want to listen to uh, Born in the USA by Springsteen. That's not what you guys are for. That's, that would be like asking the radio station to magically know that that's what you want to listen to when you turn it on in the car. You just hit it right on the head. To ask, Because our aspiration is to redefine radio, we set up our business to emulate much like radio. We've tried to be as easy, free, and ubiquitous mm -hmm. as radio is. But to, to your point, it's not an on-demand type service. So you'll hear that song, but you might not hear it right when you want to. It'll surprise and delight you when it comes in your mix. OK, so let's talk about, so radio is wonderful for ad advertising because you know you're in the car you're listening to the song and then oh there goes the ad message and uh, though you know it could be uh, entirely irrelevant to your interests but you know golly you're there big brands big national brands CPG brands ap applicable to everybody they love broadcast radio the radio people hate terrestrial by the way or, uh, which I, I re learned recently but so Tell us about advertising on Pandora. What's special about Pandora? So um, at the core of Pandora is our audio ad. And the audio ad is the red thread that connects all of our, across all of our platforms. We're available on web, on mobile, through over 500 consumer electronics devices. For example? Uh, for example, anything from a Samsung Blu-ray player to a Samsung refrigerator, okay. you can play your Pandora. We're also available in 23 automotive partners. So. Um, the audio ad, especially in this world where it, it becomes the, the really important ad unit for us, um, and you think about we live in this world where it's all about touch screens and, and um, touch activations, we think the future is about voice activation, and we think that audio ad and the renaissance around audio is going to be a driving force for the future. And a funny thing happens when you deliver an audio ad and you tell a consumer what to do, they actually do it. So you give them an audio ad and you tell them to click on a, an, an ad banner that accompanies it, and they actually do that. And our advertisers find great success in that because it's driving engagement or driving business or driving coupon downloads, whatever it might be, their objectives. So here at AdTech, we, we hear again and again and again that you know, digital is the world's most accountable medium for advertising clients. Is that, is that true of Pandora as well? Because radio, not so much, the normal, you know, ordinary radio. And that's, again, another way we're redefining the radio business is by bringing the best of digital and bringing that accountability and bringing that ability to deliver that audio ad, but also an immersive experience if you want to go deeper. Um, our, our platform only serves display ads upon engagement, so people don't get a display ad unless they look at their screen, whether it's their, their screen on their phone How do you know that I'm computer. looking? 
uh, because you've engaged. You've started a new station or you skipped a station. Okay, so that's not as spooky as I thought it was. No, uh, no, okay. yeah. <laughs> it's, only, it's when you're engaging with Pandora. And um, there is so much engagement with because people are trying to shape their own stations and, and, and use the thumb activity. We had over 750 million thumbs last month alone. They're thumbing to tell the genome, what's the music I like? And what's really neat about it is you might not even know why you like a song, but you're like, I like that song. I thumb up, I thumb, I thumb up. The genome gets smarter and smarter over time about what you like, and it could be, you know, you might have like certain rhythms that you like or tones of voice that you don't even know consciously, but that's what it'll deliver to you in the future in your playlist. That, that is spooky, by the way, but, but in, a, in a very good way. Let's, uh, you anticipated us in the back, uh, with the AV. We've got a slide up here that I want you all to look at. It was up a moment ago. So uh, I asked each of our panelists a question, and the question was, if your company was a famous musician or group, who would it be and why? But I also told them no one was allowed uh, either the Beatles or Elvis, because that's just not fair. So, so tell us about, now I asked who, if you were a, a artist or, or a group, mm -hmm. who would it be? This, this looks like you've kind of broken the rules. <laughs> I know, Brad's mad at me because he thinks I cheated, but yeah. I didn't. What I was really doing was being true to Pandora and the Pandora brand. Uh, because there is no one artist or band that defines Pandora, because by definition, we're personal. So the definition of who is Pandora is who are, who's my Pandora? So what you're looking at today is a reflection of me. You're looking at my current stations in Pandora that I'm listening to. And it's a reflection of your current stations and the 125 million registered users that we have. It's, it's, you know, it's kind of like that Time Magazine mm -hmm. Person of the year, right? Oh, and it's, it's you. you, right? Okay. And that's what Pandora is set out to do: is be a reflection of you. Well, I think Pandora sometimes has a somewhat confusing story in the public, and I think that the fact that uh, you can't actually answer the question with one artist is, is a reflection of that in some small way. But but hopefully we're rendering uh, rendering logic, uh, order from the chaos of that just here today. So we're going to have we were doing the Tonight Show logic, which is we're going to have Tidy come up, and she's now going to be in a blonde island on the other side, and we're going to bring out our next person to, who's joining us today. And we're going to it's sort of like uh, speaking of music, like that Talking Heads movie, Stop Making Sense, where we just increase over the course of the of the time. Just, Am I the only person in the movie in the room who remembers that movie? No. It's okay, not thank movie. God. All right. So, Seth, come on out. We've got Seth Goldstein. He is the, uh, the CEO of Turntable FM. Come on out. How are you? So, let's give him a big round of applause. Sit right here. So, next to. Uh, you know, no, you sit oh, next to me. Like I said, she's going to be a blonde island for just a moment, but you'll be with her in just, in just a short amount of time. So, what the hell is Turntable FM? What is turntable? So yes. Have you used turntable? I have used turntable, but I'm just going to. What, what do you think it is? So well, I what I like about turntable is you log into rooms where people are uh, DJing music and other people are are bringing it in. And so the thing that I think is exciting about turntable is that it, is this there's a, a Soviet uh, Russian term from the Soviet era called sobitnyost, which uh, which translates to eventness which is to say, eventness is where things can go horribly wrong. Right? I might fall off the stage right now and break my head open, and, and it will be very memorable. Right? And so anytime you have people doing things together in real time, right? so you're adding music and real time, so it's taking the club atmosphere, right? or the, if it could also just be the concert atmosphere, and porting it online. That's what I think is exciting about Turntable. Is that what you're trying Perfect. to do? Perfect. So, so I didn't need agree. to at all? So, okay. <laughs> A turntable is a place where you can go to listen to music with other people live. Um, it's a real-time experience. It's a social experience. Um, it has a lot of interesting human dynamics. For um, example? For example, um, when you get up to pick a song to DJ, it's not like you're just listening to it on your, your playlist, but you're actually playing it for other people who are going to give you feedback. And the better the song, the more points you get, the more points you get, the better the avatars you get. You kind of work your way up a sort of a Maslow's, Maslow's avatar hierarchy. So there's a gamification quality. There's some, ga there's some gaminess to it. Um, what's also really fun is when you do DJ, um, there's a great tension because if you pick something that's too trendy or too popular, it's kind of lame. Okay. And if you pick something that's too obscure, no one's really going to get it. So you have to find this place uh, in between, it ends up being really, really engaging. Um, and so you can either be a DJ, or you can be in the audience listening to DJs. And um, I just think it's a wonderful product, and people really love it. And there's a humiliation component possible. If you play bad music, you will get kind of booted off the stage. Mm -hmm. So 
So previously, you were the founder and CEO of social media. Uh -huh. Tell us how you got to Turntable from there. Um, 2007, middle of 2007, I remember we were based in Palo Alto, and, and social media was a social advertising company. We built one of the first platforms for Facebook um, apps to sell ads. Um, Zynga was one of our first uh, customers. Um, I remember going to see Dave Morin, who now runs Path, but at the time was developer relations for the Facebook platform. Um, and he said um, something to the effect of, um, always provide a social context. And that the power of Facebook was, whether it was education, travel, um, commerce, advertising, everything was better, maybe with, with some exceptions, um, when it was done in a social environment. Um, I focused on that in the context of advertising for a couple years. Uh, we sold social media to Living Social. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, music is a great opportunity as well, and that's what we're focused on with Turntable. So what about advertisers? So, I mean, it's, it, it, there's so much going on in Turntable, and if you log on, there, you know, there are avatars bouncing, and there's the music, and, and how, I mean, if I'm, uh, you know, Frito-Lay, I don't, I don't know, you know, I mean, you've worked with Intel, but I mean, how, do we, how does my advertising message get through, or is that not what you guys are doing? Um, so we started less than a year ago, um, and we're really being deliberate about rolling out any kind of revenue products period, much less advertising. Um, to date, I think we've crystallized around two core concepts, one of which is the notion of uh, sponsoring a room. Mm -hmm. So leading up to South by Southwest, Intel and Pepsi both sponsored and skinned rooms that were the Intel room and the Pepsi room, um, and, uh, and brought certain artists into those rooms to DJ mm -hmm. for people. So we had an event uh, a large event at South by for about 1,600 people featuring Questlove and Diplo and A-Track, the DJs, um, brought to you by Pepsi, brought to you by Intel. And so those artists were actually on live on turntable in the weeks leading up to it. Um, so we're doing a couple things. We're taking name brand celebrity talent, DJ talent, and bringing them uh, into the turntable community. Um, it's kind of like Prince playing in a private house in Malibu. Sounds where like the, the dot-com era. No, I don't think so. I think, like, you know, this no, weekend... I, I mean that in the most positive possible way, which is, you know, there was a... There's a, not a lot positive about when you talk about dot-com. Oh, well, come on. Santana okay. played an office party one week here. In this remember city. Elton yeah. John played yeah. uh, the guy from, not Sapient, Eric Greenberg's uh, wedding. So. Elton John, and they, and, they, and they flew in steaks from Africa. That's just all I remember from right. the dot-com era. <laughs> anyway. So, um, let's, move on to, let's move on to your well, slide. No, so oh, the, got, the, okay, no, what I was okay. trying to say is we're bringing... Um, name brand celebrity talent onto turntable. What we're also doing, which I think is really interesting for advertisers, is discovering up and coming talent and, and giving them exposure offline. So last night, we kicked off the first of our four uh, turntable Tuesdays at the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Las Vegas, where we found two up and coming DJs within turntable and um, we flew them out, all expenses paid, and they DJ the midnight set at the Bond Bar at the Cosmopolitan and we had avatar go-go dancers up in the window boxes dancing over the Cosmopolitan Strip. So Heidi, I just want to say one question I'm going to be asking as we, as we get everybody on stage is, so far, they're not competitors, right? They're compliments. It's, you know, we're, we're talking again about this pervasive medium that you know, bonds us to, to music, or music you know, in various ways of, of slicing into that. So let's, we've got your slide up. Tell us why you picked David Bowie and this particular song. Why does this... Why well, does I this think work? David Bowie, probably more than most, um, just blurred the lines between the cyber and the real, the, the fantasy and the reality. Um, and specifically, what I love, obviously, with the DJ song is um, he suggests that you are what you play. And the same way that when we share a photo or we tweet, um, that, that, that the music we choose is a fundamental way that we express ourselves and we individuate ourselves among people and I think it's vital and something that's not gonna go away. It's gonna become, as it becomes easier and easier to share the music we're thinking about and the music we're listening to, um, music will be just a vital uh, pillar uh, of social media. All right, well let's move you down next to Heidi. Let's bring out Mark Ruxin, who is the founder of Tastemaker X. Mark, come on out. There you are. All right, All right. come sit down. Mark, before this uh, was the chief 
Innovation Officer for, what was your last title most recently? Chief Innovation Officer. For McCann. For and Universal McCann. Uh, and also, I look forward to his roundup of what he's been listening to, uh, which you do at the Huffington Post every year. Um, now, I'm utterly baffled by tastemakers. So tell me, what can you help us to understand what it is and, and why it's important? Sure. So um, we basically took the kitchen sink of what's happening in the ecosystem of mobile, social, gaming, and influence and created you know, what we hope is the convergence of what consumers want to do. And we've applied it to the first vertical we're, um, we're launching with is music. So the idea is that this is the Hollywood Stock Exchange or fantasy sports for music. And it, so it feels like Instagram in the sense that all of the stuff that you do publishes to a feed and um, it plays like a game the same way that the Hollywood Stock Exchange did for film or fantasy sports does. So, um, so that's what it is. It's a vertical social network focused on music with a game mechanic that allows people to uh, you know, get credit for being early in adopting trends and broadcasting those trends across their social graph. So let, let's dig in for a minute because unlike Pandora and Turntable, um, you're not actually a, a, a vehicle for experiencing music directly in the same way that fantasy sports, you're not actually picking up a football, right? So is that, a, is that accurate? That is accurate. So if you think about um, IMDb, for example, in the movie space, um, you don't watch movies on IMDb. You read about movies, you discover the movies that you want to see, you read reviews from the people that are connected through the graph. So we do have a light listening element up front. I think over time we'll include more listening, but. I don't want to compete with either of these guys or Aaron who's coming up and talking about Spotify. What we want to do is build the social layer to music discovery and then build a game engine around um, how people can get credit for being uh, tastemakers and, and broadcasting that across um, a bigger social canvas than they had before. And of the three companies on stage right now, your, yours is the newest. Is yeah, we're the newest. We launched at South by Southwest three weeks ago and we're in a, in a limited private beta. Um, but we'll be opening up uh, over the next week, so we have a big uh, new set of features that's rolling out before Coachella, which starts next weekend. And the fun thing about being a social mobile app in the music space is you can plan your launch dates around music festivals. So uh, South By was one, and Coachella is another, and then uh, we'll be open for public beta before Bonnaroo in June. But um, for people that want to subscribe to the beta, this is a good time to do it. We'll let uh, you know we'll let a bunch of people in next week, and um, we hope people are playing and following along with what's happening at, um, at Coachella. And so if I'm Wrigley's gum, how do I, uh, how do I use Tastemaker to, to my advantage? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So thanks for the, thanks for the meatball question. Um, you know, one of the things Am that I, I think... Am I <laughs> No, it's, you, you, gave, you gave me the... Well, we'll see how I do. We'll see if it was a meatball. Um, so as a reformed ad guy, um, I know how difficult it is to build uh, a scaled ad platform and to build the um, personnel to go and sell those ads. I think we developed our platform as a game. And the nice thing about games, if you were paying attention to the folks that were up in front of us, is that um, consumers pay real money to buy things in a virtual world. And if you're a brand and you have people spending real money to buy real branded things, that's a pretty good ad experience. So in our game, we give everyone 25,000 notes. And with those notes, you build a portfolio of artists, which you follow if you believe in my taste in music. What happens is people buy all the bands that they love. And already, you know, the most common response we've had is, I'm out of notes. Notes is the currency in the game. How do I get more? And you'll be able to get more notes two ways. You can buy them from us, or a brand can sponsor notes for you. So if uh, you know, American Apparel or Urban Outfitters wanted to reach uh, you know, hipsters that like indie rock, they could have a challenge and you could buy five bands at Coachella and get 5,000 notes um, brought to you by a band. So our, our core focus in the, next, um, in the next quarter will be how do we allow brands to um, basically sponsor further gameplay and participation in the ecosystem. All right, so let's talk about your slide. Let's pull up. Tastemaker is the Velvet Underground. Tell us why you guys are the Velvet Underground. Uh, well, I love the Velvet Underground. So, um, so it's got to be better than that. Selfishly, um, I wanted to just you know, be on the same stage as those guys. Um, I think the, the core philosophy behind Tastemaker X is this is the game, and I think for any passion vertical that's out there, there's a game that people play, and that's the game of uh, I was into this thing first. 
And I think the most timeless and anachronistic band in the history of music in many ways is the Velvet Underground. They're still cool, you know, 40 years after they stopped making music. They were about as authentic a band as there was, um, you know, to be uh, the kind of house band for Andy Warhol during that period of time um, speaks to timelessness and also anachronisticness. They were, they're about as influential uh, a band as, um, as any, as you know, in the kind of indie rock or progressive music scene. Um, they are the band that, you know, were tastemakers for, you know, all these bands that came after them. Um, they're iconic. That's, they're, they're still cool today. There's, it's not like we're looking at a relic um, of something that's kind of come and gone. And they were a serious band. I mean, they, they really were amazing musicians. And, you know, Lou Reed and John Cale still make great music today. And, um, but they were also super fun. So, um, you know, that's what we think Tastemaker is. It's a fun game. It's a serious game. And, uh, you know, it allows people to be the people who they are. And I think for anyone that loves music, there's nothing better than the feedback that you get when you turn someone on to a great piece of music. And that's what this, that's what this platform's about, really getting that kind of reinforcement back. Uh, for your own personal taste. All right, well, let's have you move one seat down. Let's bring Erin Clift out. She is running advertising for Spotify. Previously, she was uh, at AOL, uh, and then before that, she was at Google. Come on out. Hello, Erin. Hi, Brad. So, come on. Hi. So also a member of our board Are of governors here. here? Um, and, and so Spotify was this mysterious thing in the UK for, you know, up until you know, Stockholm. Stockholm. But then I, I, first, sorry, I first heard about it when, from my English friends. Ah. And, uh, and I was uh, very intrigued by it, and then it suddenly it came out, and uh, and now you're, people are starting to, you're here now, and you're here in a big way. Tell us how, why Spotify is different. What are you guys doing differently for the experience of music for consumers, for the people? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it starts with what uh, Spotify's mission is, which is really all about access. And, you know, I think that the goal of Daniel Ack, our founder, was to create a platform that... Um, provided access to all the world's music, to all the world's people, in a way that was legal, which is very different than what <laughs> has been done in the past. Um, and that's really what it set out to do. So I think what makes it different is that it puts the control back into the hands of the consumers. Because if you have a platform and it, attached to it, you have a library of 16 million plus tracks. You know, consumers love to experience music in so many different ways, and you've heard about several of them here. They want to listen to tracks, to albums. They want to follow artists. They want to listen to mixtapes or playlists now. Um, they're interested in what influencers say, what publishers say, what blogs say, what their friends are listening to. Um, they want to listen to broadcast radio. They want algorithmic radio. I think that you know, what Spotify is about is offering all of those things on, on a singular platform. So it sort of changes the way that you're able to discover and share music. So talk about advertising, right? We, we started with Heidi talking about radio advertising. We have, uh, we have sponsored rooms with Seth, with Mark. We have you know, things that are going and with virtual goods and you know, so le a less direct thing, but also you know, just, uh, just coming out. What do, how do advertisers work with you guys? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of similar ways. I think I, you, I couldn't hear you in the back, but I think you touched on sort of that really magical combination of being able to combine audio and display and the idea of tapping someone on your shoulder and saying, hey, look over here, I have something great. And we're seeing that work pretty powerfully. I think what makes Spotify maybe a little bit unique and what advertisers tend to love about it is this, the fact that it, it really is an open platform that's API based. So probably the best example is, you know, last month we did this hackathon um, in partnership with Omnicom OMD. And they brought six of their brands, you know, Doritos, Showtime, CW, um, State Farm, McDonald's, and I'm forgetting one. And then we had some APIs. Little brands, no one's yeah, ever heard yeah. Of, yeah. Um, But it was, really, it was really amazing to combine sort of a brand's mission and their um, attachment or passion for music or how they used it in the past, and 150 developers. And they had access to our API and our engineers. We brought in Echonest, Twilio, Facebook, and a few others. And over the course of the weekend, they created you know, 35 plus new products and apps that brands could use, consumers could use, anyone can build it and it can live on Facebook, on a brand page or whatnot. I think the opportunity to actually, you know, use the platform as a platform and build on it and attach music to editorial, to gamification, to other things, I think is really exciting for brands. And we're seeing, we're seeing them do really interesting things. So, but I mean, I'm talking about, I, I'm, you know, I, well, yeah, I mean, I, I said to Mark Wrigley, like, I'm McDonald's, right? I want to sell Big Macs. Help me. Right. What do you guys do? Uh, 
audio, audio plus display, all the typical things with targeting, homepage takeovers, and things like that. And then I think that in, the, in addition to building apps, you have to promote the apps. There's always media involved, Brad. Okay, I mean, just come checking. on. All right. Yeah, how do you think people find them? Um, I think that people are doing interesting things, sort of full. I think that maybe Seth, you talked about it and bringing combined, like really integrated branded experiences. So they are, you know, buying media, but they're building interesting new content experiences around that. So there's some really cool examples that happened actually in Europe, and we're new here in the states, so we don't have as many examples. But in Europe, they've done everything. BW did this cool. Um, your uh, ultimate driving confession. So what do you listen to in the car and sing out loud that nobody else can hear you doing? And they sort of created this really cool uh, uh, integration with Facebook and other, and other um, partners where you were able to sort of upload your list and it was a really cool media execution and then it actually turned into an MTV show. Hmm. Because, so there's, there's a lot of cool ways you can do it. Does that answer I, your question? It sort of answers I'm just I'm trying to think of something that was different than what you guys have already heard, so. Uh, I thought the ultimate driving confession was I was texting while I was driving, but let, let's pull no. <laughs> up the, uh, let's pull out this, this, the Aaron slide. So tell us about this, tell this is this is so this this is radio radio head. Head. Radiohead. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. You know, I saw these other slides, and I was like, gosh, they all put like lists and notes and stuff. Like, I really did a bad job. <laughs> so this is um, this why. Is really, why does this represent you? So it's really the wisdom of the Spotify crowd. This was really not my personal pick, mm -hmm. but um, I think Radiohead for a variety of reasons. I think one is that. Um, they, they've always pushed the boundaries and done things a bit differently. So, you know, in 2007, they did the first digital download release for their uh, In Rainbow album, and that really had never been done before. And I think that it was reported, like, the, you know, the rationale behind doing it was they really wanted to offer their music to all the world at the same time, which is difficult to do in traditional formats. Uh, I think that the way that they are just super savvy social marketers, all about trying to open up um, the ability for their fans to learn more about them. So I think last year they released the King Lim al album with these newspapers and these really cool collector's items, but things that uh, the newspaper did, you know, playlists and lyrics and stories and poetry from the band, and they handed them out in certain cities or you could download it digitally. And it was really a way to get, you know, to further connect with, with their user and allow them to discover and share more about who they were as a band. Um, and, I, and I think, it, you know, at the end, too, they just, um, they're, they're, so, they're so passionate about music, and I think that, you know, at Spotify, you know, going back to the founders in particular, I mean, it was, this, there's such a genuine motive to, you know, you know, compete against piracy and really fuel the music industry again, and I think that people really associate themselves with Radiohead in that way. Okay. All right. So we're going to keep talking up here, and then uh, pretty quick, we're going to move towards questions. So we've got microphones there, there, and there. So if you have questions, now's the time to come up, and let and you know we'll we'll get to you. Um, but let's talk about well. First of all, I, I said this a couple minutes ago, and I, I believe it, but I want to make sure. I don't feel like any of you are competitors on stage. I feel like you're all doing different things. Pandora and Spotify, maybe, but I think that you know we don't, we don't see it that way. You don't see. It. So let's talk about because people keep on wanting to pitch you against each other, but you don't see it that way, and I don't see it that way. But let's talk about our so. You're not. You you both you both said nah when I you know shook your heads. We're so. also friends. So it's we're we're friends. Hard. Of course. But, okay, that might help. So, <laughs> so if we were competitive. I was saying the last time it. Mark and Heidi and I were together, it was on a catamaran in the south yeah, of France in, in Cannes. Cannes. It was so. awesome. Okay, so <laughs> we support one another. I'm talking about your companies as yeah. competitors, but but as non-competitors. So yeah. tell me why you're not. Well, our companies are actually quite complementary, and if you look to an analogy in the real world, right? You look at a record store, you look at radio listening, you look at YouTube, you look at iTunes, whatnot. They all peacefully coexist, and in today today's world, 80% of all music is still listened to on the radio. So our mission is to transform that experience and continue to give, deliver that radio experience. Right. And I'm not going to speak and for you, but... Yeah, I was going to say, for us, that's positive. one aspect of how people want to experience music. And we really are focused on you know, working with third parties to build on top of our platform mm -hmm. so that we're not just sort of fueling you know, the discovery and sharing of music, but we're also you know, connecting people to artists and bands in a different way that really better funds the industry. I mean, I think it, I think it's, and I think there's different advertisers can do very different things with our products. So I, I mean, I know where Pandora's focused, and as I say, I think Pandora's done an amazing job of really paving the way for a lot of the companies. You could have ten more of us up here, and I think it really started um, a lot with Pandora. But I think what an advertiser would want to do using Spotify and what an advertiser wants to do using Pandora really are two different objectives, and oftentimes two different budgets. I mean, so, that's how I see it anyway. So let's go into the middle. So Seth. I, I still miss record stores. 
I mean, like, you know, I missed Tower Records. I missed, I mean, I missed Virgin. I, I, that was a relatively easy way to, to learn about stuff. And, you know, we have Amoeba here, and we have it in LA. But tell me, like, was the death of the record store good for your business? Was it the thing that's, like, how, do, how, does, how does the transformation from physical media to, to everything that we're talking about today, was it good, was it bad? It's a pretty nuanced question, right? Um, I, I think, you know, in some ways, what's been great is the ease at which we can access music, mm -hmm. right? That we don't have to, when we, the good news is if you say you want to listen to a certain track of the Velvet Underground, you, you don't have to find, it's, it's there immediately, no matter where you are. And whether it's, um, you know, on my Spotify, you know, car iPhone, or if I want to create a Velvet Underground station and I want to be inspired by that genre, I can create it on Pandora and it's immediate. What's harder, um, and I do think what we've lost a little bit now that we've kind of gone away from those physical communities is the discovery, right? The sort of the social discovery. The, but, like I have access to Mark Ruxin and I can say, hey, you know what? You can follow me on Tastemaker. Exactly. I have three days at South by who should I see? Well, hold, Two weeks ago, he so, told me. So let's just let me admit, my, that question sucked, and let me try to do oh, a better a version better of question. it. Okay. okay. And so, like, what, what I was trying to get at was the reason why I wanted you here, which was that there was that bumping into the per, the person in the record sure. store and the high fidelity guys with the top sure. five and like the people geeking out about music, and that happened in places. Yep. And and be, what I what we were talking about before, which is that you know you know your companies were were actually where people can in, interact with people directly. People are certainly interacting with each other on Spotify. You know, I, I, I've just played this and I post it to Facebook and it propagates and people think I have bad taste in music. But, but I'm talking about in real time where people are, you know, there's, there's okay, that. You know, people are meeting on turntable. We haven't had any turntable babies yet. We haven't been around yeah. long enough. No, people are dating you're not hard, you're because not they've hard met. Yeah. Um, people are, going, are meeting on turntable last weekend and I talked to somebody who's like, yeah, I just hooked up with four other folks that I met on turntable at Ultra and they were going to see Dead Mouse together. So it's starting to happen. I think what's happening in general, the culture that you see on Turntable is it's not just people playing Barry White songs. It's people playing mashups that they've uploaded, that they're sharing with other people. So there's a whole do-it-yourself movement of people creating music and listening together. And then that factors into the, the festival circuit. Like there, there are more music festivals than ever, and they're getting bigger, not smaller. And it's not like people are going from, you know, that Lollapalooza is going down in traffic and more is going to Coachella. Coachella's now two weekends. So um, it's just moving away from recorded music as we know it, and it's moving into a more experiential space. And I think Turntable, probably better than any other service, um, illustrates that. All right, so as we've got a couple of people, let's actually, let's break for questions. And then the question that I'm gonna go next to, and we'll start with you, Mark, unless one of these uh, fine people ask is about mobile. Um, so, because I think that, you know, we're, we're bringing our music with us all the time. Tell us your name, tell us who, you, who you're with, and then ask us your question. Sure. Uh, Chris Rigatuso, Meta Markets. It's an analytics platform unrelated to music. But my question is, um, obviously brands want to connect with audiences and emotional drivers are kind of the new high ground. Obviously music is a social, cultural phenomenon that has emotional drivers and connotations. Is there something that you guys are doing today or maybe some other system in the world that bridges that gap so that brands can pick a set of emotional drivers and find genres, uh, specific bands, maybe even indie bands, and aggregate audience or associate their brand with that? So I just want to say, you thought my question was nuanced. Uh, I actually, I, 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 I was going to say, I mean, we actually have, there was, a, there was an app that was built um, as part of our first launch of, of these apps uh, in the fall called Mood Agent, mm -hmm. which I think actually does exactly what you're talking about, where it actually aggregates both sort of music and sound and the people who like those things around how they're feeling. So you can basically say, I'm, I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling excited or I want to celebrate and it actually sort of curates these sort of right. interesting. But what he wants to know is can, you, can the brand go in the back door, which is, you know, we're, I'm, I, you're not saying this, but you know, we're selling depression meds 
You know, right. is there is you know if <laughs> if we're trying to help people fight depression, is there a musical song now? So Heidi, the, I, the yeah, genome does this, or uh, yeah, that's one of the beautiful attributes of the genome is we have over 450 traits, and many of them are very descriptive of emotion and life. And what we'll do is take the the you know the the um, assets of the brand and the the true core essence of the brand and distill that into those words and try to find the closest matches within the genome. And from there, we start a, a custom station or a custom mixtape generated around those same attributes. So you could do a antidepressant station if you, you wanted based on those attributes of the genome. I, 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 I just, just to pile on the question, I mean, I, as a reformed ad guy, as I said. I think saying. no one's um, ever a reform, no, reformed, maybe recovering. Ad All right. I don't know about reform. As, as, as an always ad guy. The, the one thing that was interesting is that brands would associate and kind of over leverage the passion of sports. So sports is monetized on TV, print, auto home, digital, tent poles, and music is totally under leveraged. And when you think about the NFL, that's everybody. And when you think about finding, you know, urban hipsters in 10 cities, you could do that pretty easily by understanding their musical taste. So I think it's a massive and, and totally nuanced way for marketers to identify their audience. And, and uh, it's a bigger global marketplace. There are more people that care about, um, you know, Lady Gaga and U2 than any particular, you know, sports team on the planet. So, um, so lots of, lots of robust opportunity there. So, Seth, do you want to pile on here? Because I think that in terms of some of the stuff you're talking about with people and with DJs, that might there might be, is there a component there to uh, Turntable? Yeah, I just, I think echoing what Mark says. I mean, I think really, um, you can, you can, the knowledge you get through something like Tastemec or, or through any of these platforms about the kind of music that people are passionate about allows you to target. I mean, in the ad tech behavioral advertising targeting parlance, music may give you some new tools that you haven't had available in social media before. How do you, how do you, what about the, is there the counterintuitive surprise, right? I mean, because so much of this could be, you know, I think that my target consumer likes, uh, you know, I know Elton John came up earlier, but it turns out it's really girl talk, right? So like, do you, are you able to serve that up, any four of you, to people to go, no, 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 you really are looking for this, not that. Or, or even you don't know what you're looking for. Right. Right? Part, part, part of what makes a, tur a turntable session beautiful is you may be in a, um, you know, an electronica room listening to Skrillex, and then someone might play Frank Sinatra and the, the room can just go like dumbfounded, right? Yeah, because it's just so perfect for that moment and who would have thunk yeah. that it wasn't gonna be bass neck, it was gonna be Frank Sinatra. And so that's something that, that technology does not do a good job of anticipating that humans do. And, and that's sort of surprise, it's, it's humor, it's sarcasm, it's irony, all these things that I don't think any algorithm is gonna get right anytime soon. And how does uh, you know, uh, a secret antiperspirant help uh, work with that? I just keep on coming up with the most, the sort of least musical brands I can because think of. Because so. Secret wants to surprise you when it's you're wet. It's their audiences. <laughs> you know, it's women. No sweat. Right. No wow. I think we're just There'll giving, no I think it's just the beginning <laughs> stages. I think the exciting thing about being an analytics company, frankly, if you're interested in this business, I think we're all saying it, it's such the beginning stages. I mean, I think that there's so many ways that you can slice and dice the information you have. And as you know, for, for us, because we're such a social platform and we're so heavily connected into Facebook and the people who use Spotify are such heavy social users and sharers and connectors and whatnot that I think that we're actually just at the beginning of stages of not only being able to connect brands to their consumers and what their consumers are interested in or how they're feeling and what they're listening to when they feel, but how those people connect to one another. I mean, I think that it'll be an interesting conversation in another like six months. And the other um, sort of data point that we haven't talked about is the data for the artists, right? So um, being an artist platform, which many of us are, all of us are, we've got this incredible amount of data around who's their audience, what's their gender, what's their age, where do they live, what's their favorite song, what are, where are your most stations added, what DMAs are most important. Like We can look at an incredible amount of data that can help an artist go through their entire funnel of awareness about their album, engagement with their fans, driving to sale right through Pandora. And I think that's an important part of this ecosystem because we're all here we're all trying because we to love music. It. We're all trying to help musicians you know, build their futures and continue to make money and make great music. Tell us who you are, tell us what your question is. Hi, my name is uh, Chris Kramer. I'm from NetX. We're a digital advertising agency. And first, I want to thank all of you guys because you're driving innovation in an industry that usually has to be dragged kicking and screaming into anything new. Um, but my question is for Pandora. From what I understand, you guys have to pay these extremely high royalty rates. And uh, only a very small percentage of 
your uh, listeners are exposed to the advertising. And you know, what are you guys doing to plan and to take advantage of this massive scale that you have? Because I want you to be around for a very long time. Oh, awesome. Thank you. We want to be around a long time, too. So the, the first thing I'll correct is that the majority of our listeners are ad-supported free listeners on Pandora. And that really is like a testament to our, we want to be free like radio, right? Very, very few people actually subscribe. And the only reason to subscribe to our services is if you don't want to hear ads. So the majority of people do listen to us there. Um, it's true that we are operating under a compulsory license. We are happy, and I want to read reiterate that, happy to pay our artists. Um, we do pay higher rates than radio. Radio just pays performance rights, and we pay both performance and the creators of the music. And that's because the whole, the reason Pandora was created is our founder was a musician who was like doing the thing, touring around the United States in a van, having it break down. And he, you know, he'd come home after a year of touring with $14,000 in his pocket and th think he had a great year. So he wanted to create a platform in which really talented, good musicians could have the opportunity to be heard and the opportunity to make money. Um, so you can, you can find audience that likes you. You can be heard next to legends and icons as a rising musician. And that you can facilitate the whole platform of, of awareness and engagement with your fans and then driving sales. So that's where we continue to, to drive it. Anybody want to add on to that? I mean, it's a Pandora question, but uh, I think the, the passion for supporting the artists is something all, all of I mean, I, we, we've publicly um, given back over $250 million in our short lifespan so far to the, the, the music creators. And we, I mean, like Pandora, feel really good about that. It's the reason for being. I mean, we're, we are, I mean, technology is, you know, definitely ripe for disrupting the industry, as you were saying, and I think that we can really evolve it, but you can't do it unless musicians and the people who support the musicians are, are getting paid. And like Pandora, I'd say too that we'll always keep a, a very, I think we probably have a very similar ratio of converting to premium users, that the majority of our users are free and we expect that to, to remain that way as we go into other markets. I'd just add, this is one of the things that we hope to do for artists is um, when you look at the shareholders of a band, which will be the proxy for how many people are interested in this band, if you think about big artists or even small artists and you know, Facebook as a proxy for understanding your fan base, if you're big, those numbers are too big to activate. So what do you do with five million people? Do you give them all a track? How do you, de how do you delineate the most important, the most influential people? And one of the things you see, and again, we have a limited um, kind of small data set so far, is if you're an artist, you'll be able to see your top 100 shareholders. You'll be, be able to see by score, like a cloud score, the most influential person to your band. So you can really activate and delineate your fan base that way. And I think one of the things you know, we'll do for artists is provide transparency into a broad and passionate fan base that there's really no way to gauge and differentiate against. So you know, as a fan, and, and I actually bought some shares of a band, and when you buy shares on Tastemaker, it publishes with a link. Uh, to Facebook or Twitter, and within 30 seconds, the you know someone in the band, you know their Twitter handle, at replied me and thanked me for buying the band and said we'll be in San Francisco in the fall. And there's nothing cooler as a fan than when the band acknowledges who you are. So, um, I think these platforms give to bands a lot more than just revenue. I think they give a direct connection to a fan base who. Um, mostly aspires to, to have that connection. Well so uh, I'll defer my question until another conference because we have, tell us, I know who you are, but tell us who you are and who you work with. Uh, Mark Silva, Anthem Worldwide, and uh, congratulations, you guys. I think the next, one of the next billion dollar ideas is right up there. So uh, hopefully you'll still talk to us when you're big. But uh, the, um, the question is, I was just looking at Nielsen numbers specifically for Pandora, and if you look across Android and iOS, uh, you guys are a top 10 app right behind like maps and like really important things that you need, calendaring, that kind of stuff. Um, and, and that kind of drove a lot of questions for me about what are the devices doing to drive each of your usage? How much of your percentage, I know Mark, it's gonna be a little early days for you guys, but uh, what, how much of the devices, tablet, mobile, iOS, Android, how much of those are driving your usage and, and what are you guys seeing on, on, on that? Yeah, I, I can say the latest stats that we saw um, in December, 43% of smartphone owners 
listen to Pandora on their phones, which is a pretty great penetration, considering we're not preloaded on any phones like Maps or Google Search or things like, or YouTube. So I, I feel like that's a, a really remarkable testament to how people want their Pandora. Um, we also are releasing a white paper in the next week or two that uh, shows a lot of insights around tablet adoption. We've got an incredible number of tablet listeners, and we'll have a lot of insights about the differences between Kindle versus the, you know, Android versus the iPad listeners and, you know, what their habits are, et cetera. So it's, it's a primary driver of our business. 70% of our listening happens on mobile now. And while the cars are rolling out with uh, Pandora integrated into them, slowly rolling off the lots now, 50-some percent of our people just plug their phones right into the Bluetooth and start listening right in the car right now. So it is key to that Pandora on the go. The other thing that I think makes it special is that it's one of the... Um, one of the few apps that can actually background, so you can multitask while you're listening to Pandora, which for us opens a whole measurement challenge because the measurement companies only measure your you know, audience and your time spent when you're, the app is at the top at the face or if it's the first thing that you're looking at on the screen. So we're trying to overcome measurement challenges um, while we can still deliver this uh, experience in the background. Anybody else want to take that one? Aaron, I suspect you might have something. Well, I mean, I think for us, we're a little bit different, right? I mean, we're, we're newer, and you know, right now, mobility for us is, is critical and really important, but it's really for our premium paid subscribers. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, we're always looking for ways to in, in, you know, improve the overall consumer experience. But for right now, it's really our premium users who are able to actually take the music with them. So it's a, it's a little bit different, but it is really important. And once people are do subscribe to premium, the majority of their listening happens on their mobile devices. I'll, I'll, I'll just take a second. I'll, I'll answer the question that maybe you're going to ask me. And uh, people ask me this all the time, like, why, why mobile first for a music thing? And you know, when I think about live music, and it's specifically live music, you go to a show and you see the backs of people's heads and you see people endlessly screwing around on their phones. They're taking pictures on Instagram, they're tweeting, they're checking in on Foursquare. And you know, the thing I've always wanted to do, which was the inspiration for the company, is say, I'm here, I'm here now, this is what I was thinking at the time, and then say, this band is going to be really big and quantify that. And that's what the platform will show. So for us, it was mobile first. It's what do you really want to do when you're at a live show? I'm not sure it's checking in at the Fillmore. I think it's saying something really purpose-driven about music. And you know, that's why I think vertical mobile apps matter and broad platforms will be the, publish the broad publishing platform. And when I think about what I do, I push everything through Twitter and it, you know, it goes to Facebook and LinkedIn and you know, whether it starts on Instagram or somewhere else, um, I think the vertical places will be the, the shoots to the, to the broad social web. And I think you know, knowing, you know, tagging location is a super important data point and, uh, and you know, the more specific your action can be, the more value you're adding to the ecosystem. So Seth, let's end with you just on Yeah, so I think, I think it's, a, it's clearly not just web versus mobile, like, because Web for me is my Air, MacBook Air that's as mobile as my mobile. Right? So everything gets mishmashed. Um, you know, for Turntable, I, we have an iOS app. It's key. It's growing really nicely. We'll have an Android app. Um, they're more, they're better for consumption as a listener than they are as a DJ. So we'll probably have um, a more interactive, beefier experience for a tablet. Where if you're a DJ, you're going to have more real estate, more interactivity. Um, you know, as, as a user, I use all these services. Um, they're just different use cases. It's not, it's, there's different device types, but then there's, you know, when I'm biking and I have my little shuffle button when I'm cycling, that's one experience for Pandora or if I've loaded in a, a Spotify playlist. Or if I'm at home in the kitchen and I'm cooking for the kids, it's usually Sonos, it's Pandora through Sonos, or it's Spotify through Sonos. Or if I'm with folks and we're watching a you know, Google TV together, it might be turntable because it's more social. And so they're just all different use cases that aren't simply mobile versus web. So, you all seem to be having so much fun in your jobs, right? which is like really great. So I, I just want to say, can we thank these people for sharing what they do? So thank you so very much. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you. This brings our AdTech San Francisco 2012 to a close with a wonderful session. Thank you all. Thank you for coming, and we'll see you next year. So. I know there's really nothing left to say.